I believe that El Salvador is the epicenter of the new financial and technological global paradigm. If there's a single point of failure, then we are basically kept hostage. We're building on top of the Nostra protocol and the beauty about the Nostra protocol is there is no single point of failure. We have the ability to take our identity out of an existing system and say, I don't want to deal with that anymore. They went to the hospital to actually get their MRI information in the hospital. Oh no, you can have it. And they are going like, how can that be? That it's it's my body, we are on the inside of my body and I can't have the information about my body. We live in a world where we sincerely don't control our health data and it's because we don't have our own health identities. The doctors and the hospitals and stuff like that, they now have to listen to me because otherwise I'm gonna go somewhere else that's someone that does respect my control of my own identity and my own health information, etc. Uh, you have your medical data in El Salvador, you fly to a hospital to Austria, you give them your access to the data and they already have all the data which was previously just in El Salvador. I now as a patient have control over the people that want my information and are interested in my information and I have also so much control that they have to ask me for it. Is it also then possible to get paid for sharing your medical data directly? If we can build the tools that allow us to do the same like in the digital world as we were in the physical world where we control our physical bodies in the physical world and our digital bodies in the digital world, then all of a sudden things can change. Why is centralization uh, bad and where is centralization uh, bad for society? I... I don't think I don't think it's necessarily centralization that is bad. I think the problem is probably more around single points of failure, actually, if I think about it. Um, that is where it's bad, where we do not have a choice anymore because that there's a one single point of failure, be it a government, be it an organization, be it a technology, be it whatever it is. Um, if there's that single point of failure, then we are basically kept hostage. Hostage, You know, I mean, too big to fail. You've heard of that, right? Um, I think that in itself actually says absolutely everything that we're talking about here. So it's not necessarily centralization or, you know, managing something from a central point. But if it's too big to fail, then that is the problem. So... I would say, yeah, I mean, some things would be good if they're run by, you know, um, uh, like a central body of some sort, etc. But if it's too big to fail, then we have a problem. So oh, interesting. that would be my, my answer. Yeah. Um, single points of failure. They are, they are the bigger challenge. Interesting. And that's the thing that you also saw that's wrong with the healthcare system, right? Well, I think, I think right now, I mean... Um, I always sort of highlight the fact that we had 2008, the global financial crisis, and that then spawned the idea of Bitcoin. And the world was aware, okay, something is not good. We have a situation where money is centrally controlled. Um, it's, again, a single point of failure. And as a result of that, you know, things like Bitcoin came along. So that obviously was the, the world was ready. The world was basically, you know, told, okay, clearly we need to fix this up. And then Bitcoin comes along and it gets traction and adoption and stuff like that. I also think that with what we've experienced in the last five years um, in relation to health and identities and all that kind of stuff, um, yeah, has done the same thing. So in other words, uh, I mean, I've seen what happened in Austria and, you know, how people were, again, controlled by these single points of control, single points of failure. Um, and that obviously has created, I guess, enough awareness with people that, hey, saying, yeah, I think it is time that we need to do something about this. And therefore, um, you know, things like, health and managing my own health identity because we clearly don't anymore right um they they become relevant because people start to think about it people start to say hey okay there's something that needs to be fixed here so just like bitcoin money now we've got identities and my data and all that kind of stuff same story i think what we're doing right now with the salute protocol that we're developing is 
would not have worked five years ago before all this stuff happened. So I think that answers your question, right? Absolutely. And the protocol, protocol that you are developing, that's based on Nostra, as I understood it. Is, yeah. is, like, is that a Nostra protocol based on that? Yeah. So Nostra is obviously a, uh, a, a protocol that allows, that, that uses that, the public private key uh, model like Bitcoin, right? Um, and with that public private key scenario, I can control my, I guess, identity, but also control what's my identity shares or transmits or whatever it is. So in other words, the Nostra um, bit of transmission of, of information um, is controlled by the guy that actually owns the keys and or the person that owns the keys or the entity that owns the keys. So what we're doing is we're building on top of that technology, a I guess a framework. What we're doing is building a framework that is all about health, about controlling your health identity, your health information, how that is structure that information inside the protocol um, and how that is obviously flowing through relays and how data can be accessed by by obviously hospitals and how data can be data can be accessed by by bigger entities etc so yeah we're building on top of the nostra protocol and the beauty about the nostra protocol is there is no single point of failure so right. yeah so it's uh that's that's the, i guess the big motivation and it's not on the blockchain it's not to centrally organized by some entity or some blockchain company or something like that. It's just out there. It is uh, open source and no one can control that a bit like the whole, the whole Bitcoin thing. No one can control um, the relays out there. No one can centralize. They, they can centralize the relays, but I have the ability to say, take my identity away and put it somewhere else. So. And I think that's the key to this whole thing. I think the key to decentralized money or say Bitcoin is the fact that we have the ability to actually take us out of ex an existing system. I think that um, what we're doing here is the same thing. You know, we have the ability to take our identity out of an existing system and say, I don't want to deal with that anymore. So does that answer your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really cool. Yeah. Uh, and is the and you just launched that as I saw it, uh, and you are try, trying that now in El Salvador if that works, uh, because if the all all the doctors and stuff like that they have to probably adopt it and put the data. It's crazy for me, uh, and when I think about it now, um, my uh, data, my medical data, the the doctors have like I have no clue how to to access that. There's no. A platform where I can learn. Ah, let's let's look at my all my history. But the doctors have those those data in Austria at least. Um, like that that would be that's the idea of like switching that I, uh, that data from the doctors to myself. And if the doctors need it, I can give them access temporarily to the data. That that would be the the uh, the perfect goal to like have full access not only with Bitcoin with your money but also about uh, your data and health data is probably one of the most um, important one, probably the most important uh, data that you you can have about yourself uh, because yeah, health goes over everything. Uh, that's that's amazing, uh, first of all, like what you're doing. Um, but now, um, how are you doing that in, in, in El Salvador as a, as a testing ground? Yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I know stories. I mean, uh, crazy stories. I mean, I remember talking to someone last week and they told me a story where they had an MRI um, done. They went to the hospital to actually get their MRI information, the hospital or the doctor, whoever said, he said, oh, no, you can't have it. And I'm going, and they're going like, how can that be? That it's, it's my body, you know, the inside of my body, and I can't have the information about my body. And it's a bit strange if you think about it, right? So, um, and that's the world that we live in right now. I mean, it never, it didn't used to be like that, but it's definitely moved like that in the last probably 20, 30 years. So, um, so the idea that you literally have zero control over your own health data, your own property, I guess, because that information that comes out of your body is your property, isn't it? I, I would say it would be, um, is, is strange. I always sort of take this um, this opportunity, I guess, as a, as a let's go do a scenario, right? So um, you're in Austria. What is a common first name in Austria? 
Uh, Herbert. <laughs> Herbert. Okay. What is a common last name in Austria? Uh, the German one is Müller. Like uh, common uh, last name. Let's go with Müller. Yes. Let's go okay. with Müller. Then we also have the German in there. Let's go with Herbert Müller. So think about this. Herbert Müller goes into the doctor's office, right? And says to the doctor, hi, I'm Herbert Müller. Uh, you know, I have situations. The doctor actually goes into his computer and goes, okay, Herbert Müller, right? Cool. All right, Herbert, I can see this and this about you and um, your situation. And um, look, from what I can tell and what you're telling me, maybe we should do this drug plan and we should do this test and this and this. Okay, cool. So Herbert goes away, says, thank goodness, you know, someone's looking after me. And two months later, come, Herbert comes back and he's got more diseases, more issues with himself, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out, right, and this is sort of the anecdote that I try to always explain with people is it was the wrong Herbert Müller because there was 10 in the system and the doctor chose the wrong one, right? So what does that mean and what does that tell us is that, again, we don't control our information. Our information is with someone else, probably not even with the doctor. It's some centralized entity, some computer system, whatever it is that owns all that information, right? But because we don't control it, all these things can happen with it. Um, one is things like errors. Two is, is the information verified? Is it true? Is it honest? Is it all that kind of stuff? So that's the world that we live in. We live in a world where we sincerely don't control our health data, and it's because we don't have our own health identities as well. And what we're doing is to say, okay, well, instead of Herbert going to the doctor and letting them look, how about Herbert actually says, yeah, it's me, Herbert. And the doctor says, have you got any information? And you can say, yes, here you go. I can release it to you. You can see if you can see exactly what the information is. Herbert, this Herbert, truly controls that information and says, okay, here it is. And that information is also not, again, manipulatable because I control the keys of that information. So in other words, all of a sudden, the health information that is being transmitted and, and moved back and forth is verified by the actual owner and the individual. So I know that an information is most likely, I don't believe in 100%, but 99.9% .9 accurate. No one can play around in the database behind the scenes. No one can play around in the technology behind the scenes and change the fields and the information on the fields. So all of a sudden I have this ability to control my health information. I have the ability to verifiably say, okay, this is true. And as a result, um, what comes out there is, is uh, I guess, more valuable information. I have control. And all of a sudden, the doctors and the hospitals and stuff like that, they now have to listen to me because otherwise I'm going to go somewhere else that someone that does respect my control of my own identity and my own health information, etc. So that's the story, I guess, the first story. El Salvador. So um, we obviously were all there. I think it was 2021, right? When the, the law became reality. Um, I'm, I've been in the Bitcoin game for quite a long time. Um, and obviously love the idea of self sovereignty and, you know, separating money and state, all that kind of stuff. So when the law became a reality, I said to my other half, I think we should go there. We did our thing. We packed our bags. We went to El Salvador because what I believe is that if you as a government are truly willing to give away the power of money to you, to, to the people, right? That sort of gives you an understanding of the mindset of the country or of that situation over there. And that in itself, I believe, is, okay, you are literally giving that power away, which probably means that you're also open to new ideas and new technologies and stuff like that, like the stuff that we're talking about here. So I actually am in the healthcare space in Australia. I have a, a software business there um, that is in the healthcare, and I know what it's like in the traditional centralized software sort of world. Um, so yeah, it wasn't really my, my thing. So when that all happened, uh, we decided to move over here and said, okay, let's build something here. 
And that's where that came from. So I came to this country, country that is open to all this stuff, um, and then met um, people that are Salvadoran people that are actually in in this whole, you know, Noster space and stuff like that. And we, the ideas that I've been working on, um, we started to implement and started to build. And um, all that is wonderful. I mean, technology is great. Um, it is awesome. You build architectures, you build, you know, how technology needs to work. All that stuff is is, is perfect. The only thing is that how does it work in the real world? So therefore we said, okay, the best approach to finalizing and to building this thing properly, we need to make sure that whatever we've built, whatever we've created, that needs to be developed in conjunction with the real world as well. So we built it all, we've got it all behind, behind the scenes. Now it is for the real world to actually interact with it. And then once that's done, then we can have, say, we have a full package, we have the full protocol ready, and then we can release that to the world. So we were fortunate enough to met, uh, find a hospital and um, um, that is innovative enough and crazy enough to actually work with us. Um, and that's what we're doing. So we're deploying the, the phases of this project um, uh, with, the local Sal with the local Salvadoran hospital. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, as I said, it's awesome. We've just rolled out um, phase one, it's all working. And um, we're now onto uh, phase two. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's happening, it's working, it's, it's becoming reality, which is quite exciting. I mean, it gives me goosebumps, I can tell you. Really interesting. It's also um, the, the beginnings are really, uh, really, really interesting how you start that whole project, because if that thing is developed once, okay, you have all your data with yourself and you can share it then with the hospital. But if you start with one hospital, then you start from a ground where all the data is now at the hospital and you need like the clients to kind of test it and they have the data uh, and then ha have been testing that one system. It's an interesting, uh, interesting thing. So you also need probably patients that come to the hospital and actually willing to, to try it with Nostra and, and they're like, okay, let's, let's, let's see if, if that works like that. So you don't only need the hospital but also the, the patients, if I'm right. Yeah, so obviously a hospital or um, any, any organization has a set of processes that they go to, right? So if, I have, if I'm a hospital and I have a new patient, then obviously I need to interact with them. I need them to, I need to capture their information. I need them to interact with me as a hospital so that we can communicate. So if you say as a hospital, as just standard procedure, when you come to us, what you need to do is you download an application on your phone. That application will be the way that we interact with you. That will give you, we will basically send you the, all the information and the data that we we'll create and on your, on your device. When we interact, we request information. You press the buttons on the application, blah, 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 blah. They don't need to necessarily know that it's based on Nostra and they control everything straight away. It's just part of the process. Okay. So. Any, if I go to any hospital, there's always a process. So what we're doing is we're building this in a way that it becomes part of that process and we're learning how to best interact with the patients, how to best interact, create the right tools to interface with this protocol that we're building at the same time. So that's, I guess, the philosophy. So with um, social media, like we have right now, Noster social media, you don't need that. It's it's a different story. Here's an application. Download it if you want, um, and and then you know you can use the different features that are being rolled out. This is a real world scenario. This is real world, real patients, real interaction, uh, not just oh let's do social media online only. This is real world stuff. So there's you, you would almost be, I guess, ignorant to say I'm I'm just going to develop something without the real world. And then expect it to work. So what we've done is we've said, okay, we know all the things that we know. We know the infrastructures. We know the architecture. We know everything like that that we are deploying. Now let's connect it to the real world. Once we've done that, then we can bring that message to the world and then become open source and everyone can develop on us. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the open source topic is also interesting. So you're right now you're uh, 
too small to uh, make it open source or are you already open source? There's things that are open source, um, the things that are available uh, that you can see definitely. Um, as well as the same time, we're actually, as I said, defining the finer details of things as well. And once we know those, then we can actually bring it out to the world. I think open source is the key here because um, the idea behind the protocol is that once it's out there and it's, and it's available, that people can start building on it, which basically also means that people can start developing on it and develop their own tools and their own things as well. So as a result, um, you're going to get a situation where we were hoping that an existing, say, software um, um, tool um, that already exists can say, oh, well, maybe what we want to do is we want to interface with this Salute protocol because we know that that will give you information. We know that it will be genuine information. We also know that that will be um, information that is structured in a specific uh, format. Because I don't know if you know about the HL7 stuff. Um, the So in other words, these applications then by design can actually connect with our Salute protocol or the Salute protocol, not necessarily the Salute protocol, and integrate the Salute protocol in their technologies. I hope that other organizations are going to develop, build other applications that I don't even know about today, right? So that's the idea. We really want to once we've defined it properly, um, then we really wanted to push it out into the world and then have everyone just use it, develop, integrate, et cetera. About, you're talking about open source. That, that's really cool. I, I love the idea. It, and I think it's it probably takes time till you see these amazing real-world examples of how it works. I, I had this moment, um, for example, Bitcoin I always saw as a store of value. And uh, slowly in the last year, one and a half years, I developed this Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin is also like a payment system. It's actually could be a solid currency. And the one really amazing moment that I had just a few weeks ago, where an American sponsor of me actually paid me in Bitcoin. And first I looked at it like, oh, what it takes to make that tra a transaction from him, America to Austria. And it's a hurdle rate. It's, it's expensive. It's all the things. Uh, and then we, and then I was like with him, Hey, let's, let's just do it in Bitcoin. Uh, and then we settled on Bitcoin. I stored in Bitcoin or everything like that. And we did it on a Sunday evening in like, I don't know, five, 10 minutes time or something like that. And, and it was magical. Like this was this would not even be possible in the fiat world. We would have to wait a week. We would have to put a lot of banking numbers, routing numbers, anything like that. I just sent him a pay link and he paid with that. And I think that could happen at some point, maybe with the medical data where uh, you have your medical data in El Salvador, you fly to a hospital to Austria, you give them uh, your, your access to the data and they already have all the data uh, which was previously just in El Salvador or was not in El Salvador, it was always with you. Now that is really complicated because I probably, like I have no clue about uh, the world <laughs> medical data, but I guess that El Salvador does not know anything about the Austrian health data and uh, vice versa. So like uh, that, that is, uh, th those use cases will be <laughs> amazing to see, I think. Yeah. So I guess you did an on-chain on transaction, obviously, when you uh, did that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and you're in Austria, so you don't know what's possible because from my perspective, uh, I do at least one Bitcoin transaction a day um, and it takes two seconds. It doesn't <laughs> take five to 10, but it's obviously on Lightning, right? So it's a different story. So yeah, definitely Bitcoin as a, uh, a medium of exchange is is a total no-brainer from my perspective. One of the reasons that we moved here to experience this new world, right? This new paradigm of actually paying. And yes, you're right. Um, I see w the future where um, the information, the health information and how easy it is to access, but again, controlled by the owner of the information, right? The, my health identity. Um, I see a future like that. And what we're actually doing is inside the uh, protocol, what we're doing is that the message format, the format that the information is structured is based on a global health standard as well. So 
in the world. Um, and funny enough is I actually was exposed to it when I was still in Australia. There is now um, like a, this standard being created. It's a standard. It's not a, a not a forced standard. It's a, a standard that is um, about how health information is being transmitted. The, the look of health information, the structure of health information. If it's about a blood group and a blood type, it'll be structured in this way. If it's about something else, it'll be structured in that way. So the messaging or communication formats um, that is now being globally adopted. And it's been around for, I think, probably close to 30 years. So that is called HL7. And there's a specific part that's called the FHIR F -H -I -R, um, standard. So what we're doing is we're integrating this standard into the protocol that we're building as well so that that information is standardized across the world or across health. What that then means is if I'm in Austria or Vietnam or wherever in the world that I am, right, then any interface or standardized um, software system can then easily interface as long as it is inside this global standard, which is great, right? And so that makes transmitting information from, say, my phone or a relay that I'm accessing somewhere else in the world to the medical system of the doctor that is being in, 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 in Austria or whatever it is, really, really easy because they can talk to each other, right? So using the Salute protocol with that global, you know, messaging standard of health information, and then, yeah, it becomes very, very easy to just say, oh, well, here you go. I can release it to you if you want on my, from my phone. Um, or we can connect to a relay over there. Um, and then, yeah, standards across the board. So the cool thing is, I think, is El Salvador is still very uh, manual in a lot of things. So in other words, there's a lot of pieces of paper and stuff like that. You should see some of the hospital. There's all these like manila folders, you know, hanging in the big archive room. So what we're doing is hoping to do is that with what we're building here and we're defining with the Paravida Hospital here in El Salvador and then integrating this whole global messaging standard as well, health messaging standard as well into that Salute protocol that we can just leapfrog um, the existing you know, um, technologies that are out there out, out in, in the world. And that El Salvador becomes like the health communication administration, uh, I guess, um, leader um, as to rolling that out into the world, being an example, et cetera. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool, I guess. Um, yeah. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the Bitcoin Way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first 
ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Really, I, I love it a lot. Um, one thing, um, why Nostra specifically? Uh, there are a lot of uh, we, we touched on it a little bit in the uh, in in the beginning, uh, but there are a lot of like, oh, let's build it on Bitcoin, oh, let's build it on uh, some own blockchain, or let's build it on on something else. And I'm always uh, liking when people don't build for something their own blockchain. <laughs> Because yeah. usually there are some, some shitcoin involved and then they just want to make a, a money grab. Uh, but like, what was the uh, decision-making process to to come to Nostra and why is Nostra uh, so much better than, than all the other uh, technology that w which would... Uh, which, uh... So I think you sort of answered the question already. Um, I think what's happening, I mean, obviously Bitcoin introduced the blockchain and great and you can do so many things with your identity and data and stuff like that out there and then a lot of these projects became projects that were based on a specific type of functionality right so i had a coin that was built to manage files or i had a coin to build to manage education i had a coin to do this or a coin to do this coin to do this and Every single one of those coins, they're on the blockchain and they have an associated blockchain and therefore you need to transact value, you know, money, monetary value at the same time. And yeah, so that was like, okay, so it's just basically using the same thing for just different functionalities. Then Noster came along and in essence, they did the same thing. You know, they had a public and a private key to manage identities and manage control of information. Um, and I'm going, okay, the only thing is there's no central organization behind it. There's no single point of failure behind it. There's no company behind it. It's just a protocol out there. So it's a bit like Bitcoin. No one owns it. No one controls it. No one does anything like that. Whilst altcoins are companies behind it, etc. And I guess that is basically the, the, the answer, right? I, in my opinion, um, we can probably take 95%, I'm not going to say 100%, but 95% uh, of those tokens and, and, and projects out there and build it on Noster. It's just, it's not necessary. The blockchain is not necessary. And then secondly, I'm now going to be connected to a specific blockchain that I have to work with that's, if that blockchain fails for whoever or whatever reason, right, then we have a problem. So now let's do this open source. I like open source. I like um, the idea that no one can control it. No one can manipulate it. They can manipulate all they want, but if they do, I can go somewhere else. So if you think the relays that I'm actually managing or, or controlling, um, if I don't like them, I can go to other relays or set up some set up some other relays and just keep on going. So that's, I guess, the answer to your question. I don't need a blockchain. And the other thing is, Noster is very cheap to deploy. I, I don't need money for every single transaction. And if this thing is going to work, there's going to be a lot of information or a lot of transaction going all over the place. So let's keep it cheap. Yeah, that's a it's a it's a good point. Yeah. Do you think that Bitcoin, together with the Nostra protocol, which are like getting more and more deeply integrated with the Bitcoin community, like the hardcore Bitcoiners, are also all in, in Nostra? They communicate on the Nostra pro protocol with social media, and they're building other applications like yours also on on that protocol. Do you think? Because it's often like, oh, we fix the money, we fix the world. But then a lot of people say, oh, no, we, we, we don't fix all the, the problems of the world. But could like Bitcoin and Nostra together be like a, a superpower of, of protocols that actually um, uh, together tackle a lot of the problems like money, the war on privacy and all those things? I totally do. Absolutely. Um, I totally do. Like as I said, Bitcoin gives people the opportunity to opt out of an existing system and choose to interact directly with each other. That's one. Um, Noster 
does exactly the same thing um, on a information perspective. So I can transmit any kind of information across the Nostr protocol. And again, it is not controlled by anyone, not centrally controlled by anyone. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I'm, it's about one money and the other one is information. I think you could almost make a case that what we're trying to do or what we're doing is we're actually creating like, as I said, a health protocol, right? Using the Noster um, protocol as, as its foundation. Part of what we're doing is we're also integrating the Bitcoin aspect to it because obviously health information is valuable. So there can be an opportunity for people to use that health information and then I guess get some sort of feedback into, um, into the individual for sharing their information, their health information, because we still need to, you know, understand statistics, do analysis, all that kind of stuff. But now I have an ability to say, okay, well, I am going to the patient saying, I am interested in your information. Are you willing to share it? And the patient says, no, because I hate you as a company and I will never do it. Or you can say, the company can say, I am willing, I want my information. Are you willing? And then you say, yes, because I trust you as an organization and I like what you're doing and therefore I am willing to share it. If they don't have to know it's me, but it's my information I can still share. So all of a sudden the power of information and remember this information is controlled by me. So I know it is 100% genuine and no one manipulated it, right? So it's now very valuable as well at the same time. But I now, as a patient, have control over the people that want my information and are interested in my information. And I have also so much control that they have to ask me for it, whilst right now they just take it from you. Right now, that information is just out there. They take it, they control it, they sell it, whatever. And again, I keep on saying to everyone, the number from what I understand right now is Health information is valued at about $2 trillion globally. That's a lot of money. Now, I don't see that. You don't see that. But they're taking it from us. So, yeah. So, definitely, Bitcoin this can, or decentralized or, or money and then health information or information as a whole, Noster. And then what we're put, putting on is a layer, which is basically health information on that Nostra protocol. I guess you could say that what we're building is almost like a layer two on Nostra. Is it also then possible to, to get paid for, for sharing your uh, uh, medical data directly and not some, some company, uh, as you said, the two, tr two trillions that uh, we never see, but uh, they still want to do things and they can maybe say like, oh yeah, like for every set of data, we take this, this amount of, of SATs. Is that, so that, could that be reality where we actually get paid for sharing information with, with doctors and, and companies? That's part of what we're building. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that that's an interesting uh, idea where like the, again, we are like with Bitcoin, we have the central bank and then we have uh, this, this decentralizing the central bank uh, and all of a sudden the individual benefits from it the most. And the same with that, what you are building, where the, the individual is benefiting the most. I think I slowly, slowly get it, what, what you're doing. So thank you for uh, explaining to me so, uh, very nicely. Um, really, really cool. I, I love that. Um, one thing that I also uh, uh, want to get into a little bit with you uh, is uh, how it has been for you that you moved to El Salvador. So you came from, what you said, Australia? Yeah, I'm originally oh. from the Netherlands and oh. I yeah, moved I, I, I to thought Australia. So I heard it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, originally from the Netherlands, actually I, I went skiing in um in Austria for the first time in my life when I was 8 or 6 or something. Yes, a little place and, called and how? Maria Om, I think it was. That could be one. Yeah, the the the, the, the they have those kind of names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, exactly. I'm sometimes on there, yeah. But yeah, really, yeah. really cool. You have been Netherlands, Australia, um, and uh, you already covered why you moved there. But how has it been uh, since then uh, in, in the three years? What did you see of, of El Salvador? What also maybe you see from 
people that still live in Netherlands, still live in Australia, and they are seeing from, from El Salvador and how this is different to what you are actually seeing in El Salvador? Um, so we've been here a year and a half, um, and things are changing rapidly here. Um, I mean, the amount of development and growth and, and uh, in this country is crazy. Uh, I mean, development everywhere, shopping centers being built. It is amazing to see the change. We can see the change, but it's also not just development. I mean, it is also the fact that on the beach, we have now places to put your garbage six, seven, eight months ago that didn't exist. So not only is it the development, but it's also that the place is cleaning up and, and, and people are hopeful and people are excited about the future and looking to forward to the future. And the other thing is there's a lot of people that I think come here that say, wow, I really like it. You I mean, this is where we can sort of not worry about what we're saying to others. You know, we're free to talk about things. We're open to talk about things, um, which is very different. That was at least when I met, left Australia, it was very much like I have to be careful with what I say because I might offend someone, blah, blah, blah. And over here, no, it's, it's, it's very open, very free. Um, and the country is working really hard to um, improve itself and improve the world. I I believe, um, and I say this often, I believe that El Salvador is the epicenter of the new financial and technological global paradigm. What is happening here financially, from a financial world perspective and from a technology perspective is quite amazing. It's a small little country. There's a lot of freedom, a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurial type thinking and we are clearly moving from what i can see into a world that is far more about self-sovereignty decentralization etc and this country is leading it so it's an awesome place i mean what's happening here is 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 great obviously a lot to do with what bukele is doing and how he's approaching everything um, and he's pretty blunt. I mean, I don't know if you saw his uh, um, speech at the United Nations. Um, he's yeah, you know, it's he he says that a most a big part of the world is going down a very dark path. So somewhere we need to actually start building the lights and creating the lights. And it definitely feels like that um, over here in El Salvador. And I am loving it. I can tell you, I am loving the the enthusiasm the hope the opportunity um and i made the move or we made the move a year and a half ago and i am very 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 grateful for having done that so um yeah i think that answers your question right it it, it, it was beautiful uh, I, I, it this is the reason um why i have to visit El salvador and i will be visiting uh, uh adopting bitcoin by the way if anyone wants a ticket uh, there's code robin i think you get like 10 percent off the ticket uh but yeah I, i'm really really looking forward to, to adopting bitcoin and lo looking forward to meeting all those uh, people finally in person because i have been interviewing so many from there and they all uh talk so highly about it and i was at this point, I'm like, I can't, okay, I cannot interview more El Salvadorians and not go there. <laughs> like, I at least have to, uh, at least to have to check it out for like a week. That's, that's what I own my, my guests that <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, have yeah. been on my podcast so many times. And I think that's, it, it's, it will be a, a great time. Uh, it will be, it will be probably a really, really cool time. I, I'm feeling, um, a little bit anxious. I'm, I have a big fear that I might not want to leave El Salvador again. So <laughs> that, that might happen. <laughs> Let's see. Um, the funny thing is that too, I hear is common that people come over here, experience the, the whole thing and go, wow, I didn't know life was going to be so awesome. And, and, you know, things could be so cool and I could share so many ideas and hope and all that kind of stuff. And again, I mean, it's like Bukele said, you know, the a lot of the world is going down a dark path. And if you live there and you feel that and you come to this place and you go, wow, this is so exciting. There's lots of things to do and people excited and hopeful and building. And yeah, then that obviously is going to rub off. Um, I think people generally sort of feel more attracted to positive things than negative things because it makes them happier. Right? It's like a, a drug 
you want to be happy and then you're surrounded by people that are happy, then you too become happy. Um, but the other way around as well, you know, if people are negative and yeah. Okay. Who said it like that? I think the, the financial dark ages, we are in the dark financial ages, uh, and this, uh, dark ages there is trickling down to so many other things. And it's, it's great to see that there are places with hope uh, and places that uh, embrace Bitcoin and not just like, ah, we should regulate it. Uh, you should not be able to do self custody or like do the non KYC exchange, like that, that, that whole uh, BS that's going on in the EU. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, <laughs> uh, obviously. Uh, and it's not at this point where I feel like pushed out of Austria, but I see a lot of countries where the incentive is big to, to go there. But uh, there might be the point in Austria where I get pushed out because I really dislike politics. That's why I also think that it's important for Bitcoiners to at least be aware of your local politicians and local politics, what's going on, because even though Bitcoin doesn't care about politics, but politics cares about you. Uh, and that's why it's in, uh, important to at least look like, where are you? Because your physical body is still here uh, and they can do a lot to you, but not to your Bitcoin. Yeah, that's, that's uh, I think, uh, important for people also to know. I think, um, yeah, and you actually highlighted something that I often mention as well, is for hundreds of years we lived, or thousands of years or however long, we've lived in a world where um, my physical body um, is, is, is the main reason of doing things and the main, I guess, things that we built our, 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 our um, societal frameworks around, right? So in other words, the physical body is like I can – go somewhere and if I don't like it, then I can remove myself from from that place, right? Um, I mean, if I'm, I'm thinking about loud with you now as well. You know, in the US, we have the right to bear arms, to defend against ourselves, against oppression of the governments and all the kind of stuff. It's all in the physical world. It's physical type world uh, stuff that we're talking about. Because the world and society is now, I believe, more hybrid, you know, we have a digital world and we have a physical world. If we apply physical world type thinking to a digital world, then that's not going to fully work. I can make all these wonderful laws about how it should be and what it shouldn't be, but in the digital world, yeah, you know, it's 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 not a good way to be able to control or manage them. So, in other words, they can even overtake them. So, if we can build the tools that allow us to do the same like in the digital world as we were in the physical world where we control our physical bodies in the physical world and our digital bodies or our digital identities in the digital world then all of a sudden things can change so we need to have the tools in the digital world just like we have in the physical world in the physical world i can walk away i can shoot you i can do all that kind of stuff right but in the digital world, we can't. Now, what we're doing and what Nostra is doing as Bitcoin is doing is actually creating that ability to do the same thing where if I say, I don't like what you're doing or I don't like that company, I'm not going to give them anything or anything like that. And I can remove myself and go somewhere else, just like the physical world. If we can create the tools in the digital space to do that, then all of a sudden we then have an equal footing again. That's not where the, most of the digital world is right now. So that's where we're building. That's what Bitcoin is about. That's what Nostra is about. That's, I think, what blockchain is trying to achieve. But there's that issue with centralization. So, yeah, I believe what we're doing is we're, we're creating that ability that we have in the physical world, in the digital world, and say, I don't like you. See you later. I love it too much. I love it too much. Really, really cool. Um, I want to end with, uh, with the end routine now. Uh, there's two questions. One question is always the same for each guest. Uh, and the guest is, uh, the, the question I always uh, modified a little bit, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and uh, Nostra and all those things? Like what, what else can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is, is there are always ways to achieve what we want to do. For me, um, freedom is important. Um, for me, being control of myself is important. So there's always ways to be able to achieve what you, what you do. And if there's anything else, I would say always look for the positive sides and what you learn 
out of any situation that you come across. If I say to my daughter and she fell off her skateboard and has got blood everywhere, I'm going to go, wonderful, that blood. And you might think it's cool, but what did you learn? What did you learn? So always learn and look for the positives. By the way, as you're also uh, uh, originally from the Netherlands, are you visiting uh, Bitcoin Amsterdam in, in October? No, I'm not. We're pretty busy over here. Um, we've got a lot of stuff to do with the conference over here. Um, we are actually doing a uh, discussion panel um, at the conference over here about what we're building and what we're creating. Um, so organizing that and um, yeah, we're, we're just too busy doing stuff. And uh, as much as I'd love to go all over the place, you know, have to sort of be, you know, I have a project here with a local company, with a local hospital. Let's focus on that. Um, but no, but maybe next year, who knows? Really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, I will see you in, in El Salvador anyway. So one, one month afterwards, uh, really cool. Perfect. Then, uh, let's come to our end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest. And it's a very broad question. You can take it in, uh, whatever direction you want to take the question. Uh, where do you see Bitcoin in 2050? Uh, where do I see Bitcoin in 2050? I think I, so 2050 is 25 years from now. I think that half of the world will be using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange and also a unit of account. Oh, really cool. I think if uh, half of the world, uh, like every second person is, is kind of using it, then we are like almost at hyper Bitcoinization at that point. I think there's, then there's like uh, a really huge, huge step already taken. Yeah, really, really cool. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions and read more about uh, you and your project? Yeah. So the company um, is called Illuminodes. Um, I don't know if you've got any uh, logos or anything like that, but um, uh, Illuminodes is the company. Uh, you can find us on Noster, of course. Um, so um, I can share a, a QR code with you that you can share if you want. Um, and of course you can find us on x uh, as well at illuminodes as well and of course you can just go to our website www.illuminodes.com um yeah and you know by all by all means reach out um um for sure that's definitely this one here. Um, yeah that's the website and then uh, there you've obviously got the links to x and um uh, and, and Noster and stuff like that. Yeah. Amazing. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for, for taking the time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening. Uh, yes. As uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.